Okay, thank you guys for um, coming to this um, talk and uh, really glad to see so many people in this um, nice sunny fall day here and probably it's a better day for, uh, for actually for work outside or have some vacations instead of uh, stuck, sticking here for my, for my talk. So I get a um, pretty nice and neat vacation destination for you. This place has a mean temperature about 50 degree Fahrenheit, plenty of sunshine. How do you like that? Do you want to go there? Sure. Maybe. Maybe. That's a very good <laughs> answer. Let me tell you a little bit more detail about this uh, potential destination. The mean temperature is 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but let me tell you a little bit more. The daily maximum temperature is 400 Fahrenheit. Daily minimum, minus 300 Fahrenheit. You still got plenty of sunshine there, and this place is called Planet Mercury. So this is just a joke, but just something I want to tell you about this um, diurnal temperature variability, how, how it can influence a lot of things. So back to my own research today, I want to introduce you a little bit about my current research about uh, this um, understanding different sources of heterogeneity, like temporal, spatial, and individual heterogeneity, and how that influence both indirect and direct transmitted disease dynamic system. So um, here is the outline of this talk. The first one is um, a little bit introduction to the role of the het different heterogeneities in the disease dynamic system. And then we move to um, a real project we have, um, we have done that's to investigate the sources of heterogeneity in the indirectly transmitted disease system, which means the pathogen is transmitted through the contact between the host and the environment, not directly um, between the host and host. And then we switch to a um, direct transmitted disease system where you can see the transmission is actually happening between the different host, host animals. And if I have time, I would talk briefly about how I would want to link these two systems together and, multiple, and modeling multiple transmission pathways. So this is our line. And for those of you who are not very familiar with um, epidemiology study, here is the, uh, this figure shows the cornerstone of this um, epidemiology research is called triad. For a disease, for an infectious disease to happen, we need have to have three major players in the system. The first one, of course, we need a pathogen. This is the, uh, most, this is the uh, most important thing. Without a pathogen, there's no disease. Well, that's very good, but there are a lot of pathogens. We also have some need to have some host, like the um, humans, cattle, whatever, the hosts, and we also have the environment to uh, accommodate both the hosts and the uh, pathogens. For these three different players, as you can imagine, we have a lot of uh, variabilities and heterogeneities in the system. For instance, even with the same pathogen, they might have different infectivity and survivability in the environment. For the different hosts, different individuals in the population may have different su susceptibility and also different behaviors among the hosts. And for the environment, the host density and transferability always play an important role in determining the di disease dynamics. And this is the so-called epidemiology triad. Now we know that there are a lot of heterogeneities going on in the disease system, and it is very, they are, of course, very important factors. But one thing is we have to interpret them very carefully. For instance, in Chase Topping's very famous 2008 Nature paper, what he said about this heterogeneity, um, he considered a um, concept called super shatter. This is um, how he, she describes the super shatter. An individual who, for a period, is many more infectious organisms for a particular time, uh, 
particular type than most other individuals in the same host species. So he cleared, she clearly defines the um, individual variability. And this is her definition of super shader. Do you see any problem with that definition? This is a nature paper, right? <laughs> kind of uh, should be very sound. But here, we challenged her um, definition. We constructed a um, system where we have uh, multiple animals. And we tweaked these animals that, so that each animal has exactly the same shedding profile, which means in this uh, temporal scale, they are shedding um, the shedding density is, is exactly the same among the individuals in the population. Animal 1, animal 2, and animal 3, these shapes are exactly the same. But I introduced these animals at different stage, different time in the infectious state. So animal 1 enters infectious state a little bit earlier than animal 2 and then animal 3. So what happens if we do a cross-sectional study? At the um, earlier time, for instance, maybe at day 10 or whatever, we pick up this day and we do a cross-sectional study and we examine how much pathogen each animal shed. No problem, right? So animal 1, we have a lot of uh, pathogen shedding here. Animal 2, maybe just a few. Animal 3, nothing. So what we can conclude here is animal 1 is a super shedder because he sheds substantially more amount of pathogen in this uh, population. But what happens if we do this cross-sectional study again in a later season, for instance here? Now, animal number 2 becomes a super shedder, while animal number 1 is no longer a super shedder. In fact, he sheds, he sheds the um, least amount of the pathogen. So according to the original. Yeah, but I mean, uh, I, I would interpret what they said, what the mm -hmm. paper said, was the total amount of shedded, uh, and you know, uh, shedded parasites or pathogens. Because of the per period, that's per period. They specified for a period, and they didn't specify for a period. Yeah. He just say for a period. He doesn't specify well, what. Maybe infection period. Infection period. That's probably mm -hmm. the infection period. Yeah, that could be possible. So um, by demonstrating this example, we show that individual heterogeneity and temporal heterogeneity are kind of interacting with, with each other. And we should be very careful to um, differentiate these um, multiple sources for, of heterogeneity. And um, in general, as I said, we have um, multiple sources and they interact. So the objective of um, this research is how we characterize and quantify these different sources and how we can integrate this information into a real disease dynamic system. So, to do this, um, we um, collect some data um, of the um, animal contact network. This was, um, has been performed in 2011, August 2011, in a Kansas State University research farm in Manhattan, Kansas. The specific pathogen we choose is E. coli O157, specific strain for that. And uh, we have three pens of the animals. Each pen has like from 20 to 30 individual calves. And then we had monitored them for eight consecutive days from August 11 to August 18. And uh, each individual is monitored by this RFID tag, radio frequency identification tag attached on their ears. So we can we know exactly where they are, and this is really really highly accurate. This um, they can the temporal resolution can be as high as one second, the spatial resolution can be as high as 0.01 meter. So really cool, and we also collected some um, predetermined <coughs> area and uh, coordinates of the predetermined area like the green bunk, the water, and the hay. So this is actually a 
the real animal, what he looks like on the farm. Um, you see here, this is the um, called this is the uh, ear tag. Actually, it can transmit this uh, signal, and uh, we have some receivers on the corner of the farm. So, three of them can determine the position, exact position of this animal, and it's highly accurate. Um, we have uh, 20 or to 30 animals on the farm, and some are very cute, and some are a little bit pesky, as you can imagine. <laughs> Nuisance ones. Um, because of the nature of the data, um, this ear tags send out signals whenever the animal has a movement. So if the animal lay down or sleep, they just don't send out any signal to save a little bit energy power. So what we do first is we do a data standardization process. The data we re um, this um, GPS uh, this ID tag send is actually x y coordinates in the in the farm. And uh, we aggregate the data into a 10 second resolution. Um, for instance, if this ID text reports multiple readings within the 10 second resolution, we do an average to determine the current uh, location in that 10 second interval. If the tag doesn't transmit any signal during that frame, time frame, we just use the most recent one to extrapolate the position is at 10 seconds. So by the end of the day, we have 8,600 something data points for each animal in each day. So once we have this coordinates data, we can calculate a two-dimensional Euclidean distance with uh, green water and hay. And this is for indirect transmitted path, um, disease system. So we hypothesize that these different areas might have different bacteria concentration, and uh, we are particularly interested in these um, three areas, the green water and hay. So we calculate the distance, and then convert the distance data into a zero, one binary data using a point um, one feet um, threshold. So whenever the animal is approaching the, these areas within one foot distance, we consider that's a, a direct contact. Otherwise, not. So you can imagine the data set finally looks like a zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, and a very interesting one. Um, we can imagine there must be some individual variability. It's uh, very definite. And there must be some temporal heterogeneity as well. But the spatial heterogeneity is a little bit more complicated. And in this system, we propose there are two different sources of spatial heterogeneity. The first one correlates to the pathogen demographic, depending on the environments. For instance, we know these are E. coli are bacteria. Bacteria love the water. They love humidity. So the bacteria survive, thrive better in the water area than the green and the hay and general pan floor. So this is uh, pathogen a little bit pathogen specific. And there is also spatial heterogeneity related to the pathogen and the host interaction. For instance, the host will visit the um, water less frequently than some other places. And the duration also vary a lot. Um, from different areas in the, pan, uh, in the pan floor. So the spatial heterogeneity actually comes from two major sources, and we will show you how this um, looks like. So let me remind you again, let, me, let us see again this epidemiology trial. We have uh, multiple sources for heterogeneity, and uh, we can categorize that into three major components, individual, temporal and spatial. Next, we see a little bit about this uh, contact structure, what's actually happening on the farm. Remember, we have um, eight days of the data. And um, so this x-axis representing different days. Just look at the um, time series of this um, number of total contacts at these different areas. We can see a um, very um, substantial difference in the contact, um, the time of contact or contact duration um, 
in different days. Now also, very significant difference for uh, different locations. Like in water, they only um, be there for like 10 to 30 minutes in a day. And uh, for green, it jumps from 20 to 80 something. And uh, for hay, it's um, substantially longer. And of course, th all, all the other areas receive the most visit. So um, these figures show clearly um, individual hand temporal and spatial heterogeneity in the context structure between the housed animal and multiple environments. And this is the um, table summarizing or quantifying the information we've just seen. For instance, we take a look at um, what water looks like. The area of the water in the pan is only about 1% of the total area size in the pan. And um, the time duration, the average time duration of the um, animal visit to the water is even less than 1% of the entire day. But the bacterial concentration level around the water is the highest. It's 10 to the 6 CFU per square meter, while the um, green and the hay, they only have 10 to the, uh, 10 to the 5th CFU per square meter. And the general pan environment, it's about 10 to the 4 CFU per square meter. So there's a very clear special heterogeneity in both the pathogen concentration and also the animal visits to this different area. Once we have this information, we can integrate that into a disease dynamics um, model. What we do, we use an, an agent-based compartment model. A compartment model is we assume there are different epidemiology states of the animal. For instance, we have susceptible animals, we will have infected animals and recovered animals. And each state is uh, characterized by a different uh, differential equation. But for here, agent-based model is more like differ difference equa uh, equation. Um, for this particular pathogen, E. coli 0157, we characterize four different epidemiology states, susceptible, infected, suscept um, secondary susceptible, which means they are recovered from infected states, but they have only partial immunity, which means they can be potentially reinfected again, but with a less probability. So we have this uh, secondary susceptible and secondary infected states as well. So next, the force of the infection depends on the um, exposure duration to the environment, the time, and the current environment bacterial concentration in the CFU per square meter. And uh, we simulate four different conditions with one condition as a baseline scenario. That's the actual observation from the farm and three additional ones for comparison, C1 to C3, are the um, heterogeneous condition, and H1 means homogeneous. We'll take a look at um, what these um, conditions are. So the C1 has a, um, means the general pan floor has 10 to the 4th CFU per square meter. The green and hay has 10 to the 5th. The water has the highest 10 to the 6th. Condition C2 means if we can do some cleaning for the water, and reduce the um, bacterial concentration in the water from 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 5th, what would happen for a disease dynamics? And then C3 condition, if we can further reduce the bacterial concentration in the green and hay to one-tenth of the original one, what would happen? And finally, this homogeneous um, condition, there's no spatial difference at all. Um, it's like 10 to the 4 CFU per meter, square meter, and, and everywhere on the farm. So we simulate these four conditions. Well, if, you, uh, if we take an um, initial look at this uh, maximum disease prevalence, we might think the difference is not very substantial from 84 to 
69. But what I really, I'm really interested in is how that could actually change the um, probability of infection at different locations, different environments. For instance, in condition C1, where the water has the highest bacterial concentration, we have the highest probability of infection through the water. So the water is the most important transmission pathway on the farm. However, if we reduce the bacterial concentration in C2, where the water has um, one-tenth concentration of bacteria, what will happen? It will significantly reduce the importance or the relative importance of the water as a transmission pathway on a farm. It only accounts for less than 7% of the total infections on a farm. So our conclusion is spatial heterogeneity here for indirect transmitted system, spatial heterogeneity plays a key role. And so both the pathogen-related heterogeneity, pathogen concentration, and also the pathogen-host interactions between them can be of importance. So that's the end of the um, story of indirectly transmitted disease. And question. Okay, that's a very good question. Um, so here we, use, we choose a very specific pathogen, E. coli O157, because it's well studied and its life history parameters are well documented. So this study, we use the parameters from previous literature and also the um, um, concentrations, like the baseline scenario, 4556. This is also from the literature. So this is a kind of uh, more accurate representation of the system. And how did they, how did they estimate those parameters? Um, they do a sample of the, um, in the uh, farms. They do some longitudinal studies. Rick? Is it okay to ask Sure, sure, yeah, you're welcome. Dramatically. Does that not imply that spatial heterogeneity is not important? You reduce the bacteria 10 times, you get a tenth of the infected. Isn't that what you would expect? Well, that's kind of um, where I like, quantify this uh, and understanding this um, more in a quantitative, um, quantitative way. I don't know if this answers your question. Like. We don't have any assumptions. Any figures here? And any uh, quantitative stuff? So for what's <laughs> the name of the spatial heterogeneity? If I could ask it to read to maybe I didn't go post this to slide, but if you, in the other cases where you went from C3 to H1, you also reduced the, uh, the, the concentration of water by a tenth. Yes. And then uh, you also get about a tenth of a reduction in, in, in the infection from water. Yeah, that's quite consistent. Why is heterogeneity the important thing here? Why is it not just Oh, yes. Um, the heterogeneity here, uh, if we remember, um, the area size of the water is only 1% in, uh, in, in the farm. And uh, the total duration time, contact time, is less, even less, it's less than 1%. So the heterogeneity comes from here is in the baseline scenario. If you think less than 1% area, less than 1% in the um, total contact duration can account for 24% of the new infection. I would say it's um, something about spatial heterogeneity. I would interpret that in that way. I don't know if you, want <laughs> if you agree or not.
Okay. Okay. Yeah. Very good question. Thanks. So we um, steer a little bit to a direct transmitted pathogen, and um, for a directly transmitted pathogen or directly transmitted disease, the following approach is, uh, or assumption is uh, widely applied. For instance, mass action in the compartment models, which means um, animals or individuals have the same probability of infection through time, and also the same probability of infection uh, among different individuals. So the uh, susceptible animals are the same under this mass action condition. But we know this is um, quite wrong, and that's how the network analysis kicks in. So the um, content network is currently uh, has been applied in epidemiology study a lot, especially for contact-based directly transmitted pathogens like the um, 2003 SARS epidemics, and also for um, sexually transmitted disease like AIDS or HIV. So this is a very powerful tool, um, network analysis for directly transmitted disease. But there are still some problems or shortcomings about using a current status of the network analysis. The first one is current in most of the recent studies using networks, the network the spatial and temporal resolution is not very high. It's uh, about at day level or very coarse spatial resolution as well, because if we don't have a very good way to monitor the individuals. The other um, wider <coughs> widely used assumption is the individuals in the network, the rank in the content network is always assumed fixed. For instance, if I'm a very active one in this group, I will remain active throughout time. But will it be true? We don't know. So our hypotheses are, first of all, the content network could be highly dynamic. By saying dynamic, I mean the, um, the network structure is different. The changes through time rapidly in a day. And the individual rank can also change through a day very rapidly. What does that imply for a disease transmission model? Does it, will it change the disease prevalence? Will it change the um, individual contribution to the infection, new infection? We don't know. So we will um, construct a model to do that. So before I head into the model part, I would say this is actually directly transmitted disease, and uh, they are contact-based. So a lot of things are related to animal behavior. And I would say animals are really beautiful people. And if you ha ever have a chance to visit a farm, you can see some animals, for instance, the cattle or cows. Some are very cute and cuddly. Some are pesky, just like this one. I don't have a good representation for the cows. I personally prefer the penguins. So do you guys know who they are? <laughs> Any idea? Yeah, they are from the <laughs> Linux. <laughs> we have a Linux tux here. Nice. Yeah. Whoever can, anyone ID these penguins win a prize. <laughs> so these four guys are, the, they are from the cartoon called Madagascar. And this one is um, um, Kowalski. Pesky, um, can I remember the name for this guy? This is a private, and this is a leader of the these four penguins. They are really, really genius, genius penguins. So, but they have different personalities, and they form a very perfect team. So, we have a diverse group of uh, penguins, but I feel a little bit even luckier because I have a more diverse group of animals. We have three pans of cows, about. 70 to 80, 80 kettles. So what we, what we do here is we investigate this uh, content network and um, using a similar approach with the previous indirect transmitted pathogen dynamic system. Um, because we have this uh, position data for the um, animals, we can calculate the distance between each pair of the animal on the farm so that each time interval is still at a 10-second resolution. And uh, we aggregated the network, the content network, like how many contacts 
in the one hour resolution, um, it's still much higher resolution than currently used, maybe daily resolution, something. And uh, we compare the network structure and individual rank and see what happens. So this is a <coughs> cross-sectional view of the content network. This is uh, uh, midnight, 2 AM. Um, well, of course, we are sleeping, and this, this animals are sleeping as well. So there are only a few contacts between them. And this guy sleeps really, really well. She has no contacts with um, anyone else in the farm. But six hours later, 8 AM, it's um, breakfast time, right? <laughs> there are a lot, a lot of, lot of um, contacts among these animals on the farm. And then at 2 p.m., um, when they just finish up their lunch, still a lot of uh, contacts and um, same thing. What does the thickness of the line represent on the line? The thickness represents how many contacts during the one hour interval. The thicker means more number of contacts during the one hour period. OK, so besides this um, network figure, we also investigated its um, time series of number of contacts um, in an hourly scale. And uh, we can see a very clear diurnal cycle of the network, um, the number of contacts. This is pen 1, pen 2, and pen 3. However, if we aggregate this hourly data into a daily level, this uh, diurnal cycle thing vanishes. You cannot see this. Um, high and low fluctuation at day level. You have to look, at, look into it in an hourly level. So this, is, this shows the importance of the temporal heterogeneity. And uh, our another hypothesis is that the individual rank in the population also changes rapidly in the day. So what is the uh, alternative hypothesis? The alternative hypothesis would be, well, if the animal, the most active animal is most active in the first period of the time um, duration, it will remain most active. So for instance, if we have um, for pen one with 21 animals, um, we rank them according to their number of contacts. And uh, the most active one will get a number 21 and this active one will have number one. And if the rank is fixed, we expect to see something like this. After eight days, the highest, the most active one, always the most active, he accumulated a lot of um, ranks during the eight day period, or equivalently to about 200 hours interval. The least active one, he only accumulated a little bit rank. So this is our alternative hypothesis or hypothetical population. But what we actually see in this repense is the cumulative um, rank, pen one, pen two, and pen three, substantially is substantially different from our hypothetical one. In fact, they almost look like they are from a uniform distribution. Yeah, even if not in the solid, you cannot see something as low as this. OK, I see. Yeah, if I rank them, yes, 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 yes. That's a very good suggestion, yeah. So anyway, uh, we can see a very different um, thing from uh, fixed rank. So they are the rank in these individuals are definitely not fixed. Then we can, tra uh, we can incorporate this information in our transmission model. Still, it's a um, susceptible infected and uh, recovered type. And uh, this time, we don't specify any specific pathogen or disease system, but it's a hypothetical one because we don't have to deal with like different concentrations in different environments. We just um, assume the force of infection is proportional to the product of number of contacts. And um, 
number of uh, infected animals in that particular time interval. And um, because we have both temporal variability, the hourly temporal variability, and both uh, rank change, um, we do a combination, and we have a combination of four different conditions. We simulate four different conditions with or without uh, each one of these variabilities. And uh, to be more careful, we simulated two sets of the parameters um, to represent the fast and low dynamics of the disease. What we see here is um, this is the time series of uh, first the parameter set of, we, or we call it the fast dynamics. Um, this is the uh, transmission probability, and this is the recovery rate, recovery probability. And uh, <coughs> C1 is uh, with neither temporal variability nor rank change. C2 is no temporal but with rank change. C3 is uh, with temporal but no rank change. C4 is with both variabilities. So if we just look at between C1 and C2, we compare the black line and the red line. We see C1 is substantially higher than C2, and the dynamics is um, very different which means the rank variability plays a role here. And um, C1, uh, uh, sorry, C2, if there is rank variability, it tends to decrease the disease prevalence. Our explanation for that is if we have a fixed rank through the time, the most active one will always be the most active and he has a higher probability to get infected versus if the rank is like a complete per permutation, the most active one might be the least active one. So the transmission probability jumps from very high to very low. So that might decrease the disease prevalence. Same thing happens between C3 and C4 where you see C3 is higher than C4 where C3 has no rank variability, but C4 has rank variability. So this is our expansion for that. And if we look between C1 and C3 and C2 and C4, C1 is um, lower than C3, which means temporal variability could be able, they c is able to increase the disease prevalence. And the same thing is C4, the blue line, is higher than C2. Still, C4 has a temporal variability, but C2 doesn't. So temporal variability, if we have temporal variability, that seems to increase the disease prevalence. So in summary, the role of individual rank change and the temporal variability seems to, in the two directions, if we have individual rank variability that tends to decrease the disease prevalence. If we have temporal variability that tends to increase the disease prevalence, so that's why C1 and C4 actually looks the most similar one in the four conditions, where C1 has neither variability, but C4 has both variability. Our expansion for that is these two factors counterbalance each other, because temporal variability increases the prevalence but individual rank variability decrease. So if we have these two factors interact with, with each other, they tend to counterbalance each other. This is the, for the um, um, parameter set one, and this little number here is called the Gini coefficient. It measures individual contribution to the new infections. Gini coefficient is uh, usually applied in economics. And um, the higher th this number is, which mean, it means the more variability in the relative contribution to the new infection. So here, C3 has the highest uh, co a Gini coefficient, which means in this um, condition, some higher rank individuals contribute more infections to the new infection than others. So we see this uh, pattern again with the uh, parameter set two. Now, C1 is higher than C2, 
C3 higher than C4, C3 is higher than C1, and uh, C4, uh, C, C4 is higher than C2. So it again demonstrates the importance of the both the temporal variability and also this uh, individual rank change. So our conclusion is that the content network can be changing rapidly in a day, and individual rank can also change. The disease dynamics, individual contribution to the new infection can also change. And that's the um, end of my current research. And for my future study, I want to investigate a little bit about interaction between the, these two disease systems, because some pathogens, for instance, E. coli, can have multiple transmission pathways. It can be aerosol. Uh, sorry, it can be direct contact, can be aerosol, can be foodborne or waterborne. And how we can, how we link these different pathways together is a very important question. And um, here, our hypothesis is that can indirect transmission pathway interact or facilitate with direct transmission pathway? We've seen this figure before. Now we see it again. This is a number of contacts of the direct transmitted disease system. And we can see there are some peaks in the day. This represents a lot of higher number of um, contacts in that. But what happens in that, we might ask. So I'll give you a very quick example. Um, I have this. Uh, five cows on my farm. Hopefully you can, you can say that's a cow. So this is uh, just the general time, nothing. They have some social contacts with each other, maybe a little bit. And uh, they're wandering around this pan floor. This is uh, just uh, maybe um, early in the day. But what happens at 8 AM? Big Brother is feeding you. So they gather around the food. Even some of these individual animals, they don't like each other. Maybe they are not that friendly. They have to, or they are forced to go to this food area to compete for the food. Otherwise, it will be depleted very soon. So this, is, this might be a way of how indirectly transmitted pathway can actually facilitate directly transmitted disease. Because sometimes these animals, they do not necessarily need to contact with each other. But because of the food problem, they have to. So our future work is how to differentiate and then quantify the direct contacts. Um, we propose a little bit things like we can um, characterize that into three major components. One is uh, based on the social contacts that, so that some animals, they have higher tie, stronger ties with each other in the social content network. There are some random contacts between these animals, just um, sto pure stochasticity. And also, some indirect contact facilitated contacts. In this case, the eating or the feeding time determines their contacts. This is for the pan animal. And we also observe that for the for the animals in the pasture, it's actually in the drinking. Um, whenever some leader animals wants to drink, they go together to the pond to drink. So drinking might create a um, pathway for um, a lot of new, in, uh, new direct contacts happen. So that's what um, our future work would look like. So this is the end of my talk. And I want to acknowledge, of course, um, Dr. Christina Nances, my postdoc supervisor, and uh, College of Veterinary Medicine uh, in UT for um, supporting my research. And this data set was collected in Kansas State University. And I also want to um, thank this uh, Mike, Brad, and David they're from Kansas University to collaborate on this project. Of course, Nimbus for um, giving me a very good opportunity to um, study here and also um, providing the support for these visitors from Kansas. And I talked a lot, a lot on ABMs with Lou, Suzanne, and Andrew. 
and uh, meal for network analysis and um, candidates engagement for the epidemiology, general epidemiology models, just to name a few. Um, so, any questions? <laughs>